the log. I'm Charles Purcell. Thursday, December 3rd, 48 days until Joe raises his right hand. Exactly one month to January 3rd, that's when the new Congress is sworn in. And then two days later, in some unfortunate timing here, uh, too bad they couldn't do it a little earlier, January 5th is the Georgia runoff where two U.S. Senate seats are in play. And, of course, you know if the Democrats win, boom, majority. If they lose, boom, minority. So it's a pretty big deal, as Joe would put it. If if you're interested still in moving to Georgia in order to vote in that runoff, which I've been recommending, let's all move to Georgia. Uh, The deadline for voter registration is December 7th, so you better make it quick. (laughs) You got four days to move to Georgia and uh, register to vote, which I highly recommend. And if you already live there, if you're listening in the Peach State right now, uh, don't forget, December 7th, if you're not already registered, get yourself registered. And then early voting begins on December 14th. So there's some dates to keep in mind. Georgia, Georgia. Well, we're here high atop my apartment building. Standing guard, looking over the Lake Michigan shoreline and downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin. From my perch here in River West, the greatest neighborhood in the world. So, as you know, I moved from a house to an apartment. I downsized. It was long overdue. It was long overdue. And so happy that I did it. I was a little concerned about apartment living because I've been in a house for so long. Uh, Okay, well, noisy neighbors, that's a problem, right? So far, no, not a problem at all. I hear the occasional little uh, bump or knock or something, but no, I'm not hearing loud music or or yelling or anything, not at all. So my neighbors are nice, calm people. That's good. Another concern I had has come to pass. Sometimes I go into my bathroom and it smells like a bar from the 1980s. (laughs) Somebody, somebody in this building is smoking (laughs) and it's, it's a high rise. You know, there are a lot of apartments here, so it's going to happen. It's a, it's against the rules, of course. But, uh, yeah, that, that stuff travels, man. There is no containing cigarette smoke. Holy cow. So it's only occasionally this happens. I guess I'll live. There's a little vent in my, uh, in my bathroom. I think I'm going to (laughs) block. I've got other ventilation. I don't think I'll do any harm, but that's definitely the source of the smoke smell. And, and it's pretty rank. Uh, it, it took me back. I had a, a sensory, one of those sense memories you get. My dad was a smoker. And uh, he smoked everywhere, including the bathroom. Okay, now this just sounds weird, but I don't know. He was just of that generation. He smoked while he shaved. <laughs> he just always had to have a butt going. And uh, we lived in a small house. We only had one bathroom. So I wake up in the morning and I'm doing the morning dance, right? And it's like, dad, knock, knock. I got to go to the bathroom. Well, come on in. I come in this tiny bathroom filled with steam from the shower he just took. And now he's standing in front of the mirror, shaving cream. He used the little cup and brush, the little click, 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 cup and brush. Oh, yeah. That was my dad. And he's shaving and he's got a butt going. So in this tiny little five by 10 bathroom, completely consumed with the fog and the steam of his hot water and recent shower and his cigarette smoke, his Pall Mall straight. (laughs) I'm in there having my morning relief. Oh man. 
Yeah, my parents, when I was young, they, they both smoked in the house, anywhere, everywhere. Lord. I'll tell you one other thing about apartment living that also took me back to my childhood, and that is my uh, front door, my main door out into the hallway, right? Well, the hallway is, uh, is lighted. It's lit. And there's, so there's light shining through that little slit at the bottom of the door. When it's dark in my apartment, when all the lights are off, there's that light under the door. And that immediately took me back to being in my bedroom as a kid at home. And I'm in bed and my parents are still up and there's that light under the door. And I can hear their muffled voices. They'd stay up and watch the late news and Johnny Carson and whatever. And, you know, they didn't fight. I don't remember them ever fighting. The closest thing they came to fighting were those late night conversations when my dad would raise his voice a little bit and I'd hear him saying things like, you just don't understand (laughs) because he liked to complain about work. And after he got a few drinks in him, because my dad would typically have a little brandy and ice going (laughs) as they watched television. After a few brandies, he'd get a little more vocal about his complaints at work. He was always smarter than his boss. (laughs) <laughs> that's where I get that. <laughs> I'm always smart. Any boss I've ever had, I'm always smarter than my boss. That's why I've avoided as much as possible ever having to have a boss. I've, I've chosen work that didn't include that relationship in my life because I knew. Ugh. Anyway, yeah, he liked to complain a lot about his work. And my mother made the mistake of trying to help. She would offer suggestions well, maybe if you tried this approach or if you said this to your boss. And he wasn't looking for help. He wasn't looking for advice. (laughs) My poor mother, just try to help. But no, when you're complaining, when you're venting, when you're bitching and moaning, you're not looking for advice. You're not looking for help. You're not looking for a solution to your problem. You just want somebody to listen, tell you you're right, be empathetic, be sympathetic, I just nod your head. Oh, you poor dear. <laughs> the burden you carry. <laughs> my mother, my mother n- never quite learned that lesson. <laughs> so, yeah, in my dark apartment late at night, I get up to go to the bathroom and I see that uh, light shining from under my door. And these are the memories that come back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is a little odd having that light on out there. Oh, that life, life continues elsewhere. The occasional muffled voice from a passerby in the hallway going to the elevator. Yeah, I'm an elevator person again, too, uh, every day. I, I suppose I could take the stairs. Uh, it's 21 stories. I, I probably ought to. I, I need to get in better shape. I really do. Let's be honest. <laughs> so maybe I'll make that effort because it's, it's kind of weird being an elevator person in this age of COVID. The thought is always there at the front of my mind on every elevator ride, whether I'm sharing the elevator with someone or not. I'm in this enclosed space and then, oh God, if somebody gets on, everybody's very good about wearing masks here. I like my neighbors, but still you just can't avoid the, uh, the thoughts of doom. Other than that, uh, it's kind of pleasant. My neighbors are very nice. I like them. They strike up conversations in the elevator. So yeah, I'm an elevator person again, (laughs) or maybe for the first time. I don't think, I'm trying to think back if I've ever been an elevator person before. No, no, the, uh, I've lived in apartments uh, at previous times in my life, but they were walk-ups. So there's a whole uh, elevator etiquette and culture going on. We'll have to explore that further. (laughs) Hey, I saw a nice headline. Christmas star to light up December sky for the first time. Get this in 800 years. Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah, I happen to see this on the uh, WGN website out of Chicago on December 21st which by the way is the winter solstice. So it makes it even cooler. 
humans can witness something not seen in nearly 800 years. During the upcoming winter solstice, Jupiter and Saturn will line up to create what is known as the Christmas star or star of Bethlehem. These two planets haven't appeared this relatively close together from Earth's vantage point since the Middle Ages. God, science is so cool. Alignments between these two planets are rather rare, occurring once every 20 years or so. But this conjunction is exceptionally rare because of how close the planets will appear to be to one another. Patrick Hartigan, astronomer at Rice University, told Forbes. I guess that's where the original reporting happened. You'd have to go all the way back to just before dawn on March 4th. They get it down to the date. 1226, just before dawn, March 4th, 1226, to see a closer alignment between these objects visible in the night sky. Stargazers in the northern hemisphere, that's us, we should turn our heads and telescopes to the southwest portion of the sky about 45 minutes after sunset to see the planets align December 21st. However, reportedly, sightings can be seen throughout the entire week. But I guess the optimal moment here is December 21st, about 45 minutes after sunset, look to the southwest portion of your sky. That's pretty cool. I like that. And I think it was just yesterday, wasn't it? We mentioned the uh, winter solstice. We'll have to certainly have some conversation about that as it approaches. Let's see, what day of the week would that be? December 21st this year falls on a Monday. While we're at it here, let's uh, check the exact time. Winter solstice 2020 in the Northern Hemisphere will be at 7.30 a.m. on Monday, December 21st. And then that evening, the Christmas star. All right. Well, in, uh, in less pleasant news, CDC has told us that uh, according to their figures, between March 15th and November 14th, in that uh, eight-month period, 345,000 more people than normal died in the United States. And it's a simple calculation. They just average out deaths per year, and you can project how many people you would expect to die in any given period based on past figures. So the excess deaths, as they call it, is anything above that expected number. So these excess deaths, 345,000. Now, they give us that November 14th date. Uh, we had about roughly 240,000 deaths reported on that date from coronavirus. 244 is what I'm looking at here. So 100,000 more. Hmm. So the experts don't really know about these excess deaths. It's hard to figure. Either uh, the virus is undercounted by 100,000 or there are uh, deaths potentially could be indirectly related to COVID-19. So that might be, uh, as they put it here, deaths, looking at the CDC website, deaths from other causes occurring in the context of healthcare shortages or overburdened healthcare systems. So however you slice it, for that eight-month period, and we're still in the middle of this thing, 345,000 excess deaths in the United States. Now, the Orange Menace and others who were just adamant about reopening the economy kept talking about mental health and suicide. And it always bothered me how casually they talked about this. You don't talk about suicide casually. Because when you do, it can, it has the potential of actually encouraging more suicide. Even if you say it's a terrible thing and a sad thing, the fact that you're just mouthing off about it, experts tell us, is a bad idea. So I'm going to try not to do that right now as I speak about it. Well, the logic that the Orange Menace and others were trying to use was, well, because of increased anxiety and mental stress, there's going to be massive suicides. And some might look at this 100,000 number and think, oh my God, look at all the people committing suicide. Well, that's not the case. 
See, you can't just mouth off like you're the know-it-all drunk at the end of the bar. Cut it out. I looked into this a little bit. Newscientist.com. Claire Wilson has a pretty good article about how we should be much more careful as we talk about suicide and the pandemic. And she points out that the numbers don't lie. There has not been a significant increase. There's no statistical data that tell us that there's been a rise in suicide rates. Now, yeah, there is a danger of anxiety and mental health complications due to the pandemic. That kind of stands to reason. But so far, the numbers tell us that it has not resulted in a rise in suicide rates. So that's good news. I'm happy to hear that. Mental health charities have long had guidelines on this subject for how the media should report suicide to try to minimize the risk. I'm reading now from uh, Claire Wilson's piece. They say coverage shouldn't include sensational language, nor should it suggest that anyone's death had a simple single cause, as this can encourage others in a similar situation to follow suit. Some researchers have become concerned that sensationalist predictions about a surge in suicide could risk normalizing the idea that this is a rational way to respond to the pandemic. Now that the first figures are in, we can see that the claims that suicide would increase during the pandemic seem to be wrong. It's time for such dangerous predictions to stop. That's medical reporter Claire Wilson writing in newscientist.com. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take that lesson to heart, all of us. And I'll point out right now that if you need the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, it's 800 273 8255. Again, 800 273 8255. Available 24 7. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Well, I don't like to. Uh, <laughs> I've had this conundrum here for quite a while. I, I, wa- I really do want to stop talking about the Orange Menace and Bill Barr and you know, the rest of them. I really don't want to talk about them, but we have no choice. This is just being an adult right now in this country. We, we can't pretend they're not there. We can't just wash our hands and say, oh, thank God that's over. Because they've still got 48 days to wreak havoc and they're doing absolutely everything in their power to do it. The latest headline that caught my eye You may have heard that bootlicker Bill Barr has promoted U.S. Attorney John Durham to special counsel. Durham was was the person he put in charge of the uh, Mueller investigation. In other words, the investigate the investigators investigation, claiming that Mueller overstepped his bounds and that the Obama administration spied on the Orange Menace, all these ridiculous charges. And Senate investigative committees have looked into this, and the FBI has looked into it, and the intelligence community has looked into it, and they found nothing. But bootlicker Bill is just uh, not giving up on this, I'm sure, at the direction of the Orange Menace. Well, the reason this is important now is because Durham has now been appointed as a special counsel, and this gives him a great deal of power and autonomy. And some analysts here are speculating that the reason is they want to tie up the incoming Justice Department. And whoever has to sit for confirmation hearings as the new attorney general will be bombarded by the Republican side about this issue. Well, you have to support this special counsel. It's already been appointed. The incoming attorney general can't just fire John Durham. That's not how the system works. So that investigation is going to be sitting there for a while. I mean, you know, these things can take years. And Biden and his attorney general, well, there's nothing they can do about it. And then as this one piece, let me see, I'm looking at the AP right now. Uh, Michael Balsamo and Zeke Miller, they point out that any investigations into the Orange Menace and his myriad nefarious skullduggery will certainly be seen by the Republicans as political and as a backlash to this Durham investigation. 
so they can just muddy the waters for years to come. So that's just one more example of many. We talked about Mnuchin yesterday at Treasury, tying up funds where where Biden can't get at them. Yeah, they are sabotaging and manipulating the gears of Washington just to make it tough or damn near impossible for Joe and his new crew. All right, well, speaking of the orange menace here, a couple of things we got to keep our eyes on. (laughs) Okay, this this one's a little weird. This was like uh, the Iran-Iraq war. Who do you root for, right? Sometimes the two sides of an argument are both just so deplorable that it's it's hard to figure out where you stand. Uh, Here's another example of this. Trump threatening to veto annual defense bill. Now, the reason he's (laughs) going to veto it is because of Section 230. That's the shorthand for a federal law that protects platforms from being responsible for the content that people share on their sites. So, of course, the Orange Menace is constantly in feuds, especially with Twitter, about them not allowing him to lie and spread crazy conspiracy theories and uh, promote dangerous, lethal activity on their site. So people on all sides, left, right, and center, are concerned about how the Internet is exploited by hate groups and liars and fake news propagators, of course. But this uh, so-called Section 230 has been what this article anyway calls uh, one of the web's foundational laws because it spares sites and services from being held liable for the content posted by their users. And without it, the internet really is a very different thing. So I'm not going to entertain all of those arguments right here in the moment. It's a big complicated problem that we have to deal with. But the story here is that the orange menace, of course, never sees nuance. (laughs) He just wants to smash Section 230 because he's mad at Twitter. And he's insisting that Congress repeals that federal law or he will not sign the annual defense authorization bill. Now, here's where it gets into the two things. Who do you root for? Well, I can't root for the orange menace under any circumstances. But does that mean I have to root for this annual defense authorization bill of nearly, get this, one trillion dollars? I mean, we knew it was coming. We saw the numbers climbing year after year after year. Yeah, the annual defense budget is now approaching $1 trillion. It was just a couple of years ago. It was $600 billion, then it was seven, then it was eight. Now we're damn near at $1 trillion in military spending. Now, (laughs) just because the orange menace is at it again, and is using his power like a bully on the playground, even that's not going to make me blindly say, oh, no, we need this defense authorization bill. Which you can bet, dollars to donuts, as my sainted mother used to say, that's exactly what everybody in Congress is going to say when they're trapped in the hallways by these reporters and their six-foot pole microphones. Oh, we must appropriate our defense funds for the good of the nation. All of a sudden, it's fine because it's been placed on the other side of an orange menace argument. What an easy trap. (laughs) When you have two unacceptable positions at odds with each other, you don't have to automatically accept one of them. Yeah, we need to hold on to Section 230 for the time being, and we have to get serious. We have to act like adults for the first time in years and tackle this very large issue of free speech and the internet. At the same time, we also have to look at this certifiably insane runaway military budget and completely rejigger our priorities in this country. These are two massive, complicated, and urgent issues. To frame them as just today's news cycle debate And to think that one has to lose and one has to win today. It's a perfect example of how politics in the moment and this daily changing news cycle deceives us into looking at huge, complicated issues in the context of this very limited framework. This good and bad, winner-loser, 
has to be settled like a half hour sitcom. You have to have your solution so we can get on to the next one. Yeah, don't let this story, don't let this headline lure you into that way of thinking. And then finally, again, pulling from the file of things I don't want to talk about, I don't want to think about, but if we're going to be adults in the room, we've got to acknowledge. Hi, ay, ay, Michael Flynn, former national security advisor, of course, pardoned by the Orange Menace, shared a tweet yesterday calling on the president to invoke martial law and have the military hold a new election. Reading from Business Insider right now, just the bullet points. The message was an ad from a right-wing activist group asking Trump to, quote, declare limited martial law to temporarily suspend the Constitution in order to have the military implement a national re-vote that reflects the true will of the people. Flynn shared the press release about the ad on Twitter, tagged several Trump-supporting lawyers and media personalities, and wrote, quote, Freedom never kneels except for God, unquote. Yeah, if you don't know how crazy Michael Flynn is, he's also a QAnon guy. Yeah, he's a QAnon guy. Maybe he's Q himself, who knows? Business Insider is quick to point out the president does not have the power to unilaterally cancel, delay, postpone, or change the date of an election, even if he declares martial law. And declaring martial law does not suspend the Constitution. The military also has no role in administering elections, and even if it did, it could not implement a national revote. So there's the bullet points from Business Insider. So in a sense, yes, it's a joke, but these very dark jokes need to be taken seriously because, of course, as we've talked many times, a good portion of these deplorables, a good portion of the U.S. population, not sure how to enumerate, maybe 10 to 15 to 20 percent of folks in this nation are literally ready to pick up guns and start shooting. And, uh, Speaking of hate groups on the web, there is plenty of documentation. People getting really loud about Second Amendment remedies, so-called. And the upcoming inauguration being the spark to set off this civil war that some seem to be advocating. Now, so far the system is holding. Outlandish ideas like this are a joke. But there's nothing funny about high-profile people like Michael Flynn and the Orange Menace himself fanning the flames of these kinds of ideas. The system so far is holding, but we can't laugh this stuff off. And we have a duty, each one of us, every damn one of us, as a citizen of this planet, has a duty to acknowledge the abhorrence of all of this we got to shine a big old light on it. We have to call it out for what it is and do everything in our power to stamp it out. So that's where I leave you today. There's your assignment. All right, that is the log. I'm Charles Purcell. I love you. Talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>